Good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming. I'm honored and pleased to open the first pa uh, panel of today. And our panel is titled Cross Implied Ethical Subject in Social Science and Law. And we have uh, three distinguished speakers. I'll present each before he or she give uh, their talk. So we start with Professor Chaim Chazan, who is a professor of sociology and social anthropology. His main areas of interest and in research cover the life course, time, cultural and interactional aspects of old age, total institutions, community, nationalism, and collective memory. He published numerous articles and several books, including The Limbo People, A Study of the Constitution of Time Universe Among the Age in 1980, Paradoxical Community in 1990, Managing Change in Old Age 1992, Old Age Construction and Deconstruction 1994, from First Principles and, Exper and Experiment in Aging in 1996, and Simulated Dreams, Israeli Youth, and Virtual Zionism in 2001. His current work focuses on intergenerational relations and life stories. He is a co-director of the Minerva Center for the Interdisciplinary Study of End of Life and a member in the Herzig Institute of a Aging. His lecture is titled The Disciplined Other on the Moral Evolution of Alterity in Anthropological Discourse. Hi, please. Thanks, Daphne. I would like, if you, with your permission, I would like to kick off with a personal word. Um, five years ago, my um, intellectual evolution was struck by a mutation. I joined the ranks of the Safra Fellows. <laughs> and, uh, and, and that proved to me, once and for all, that the ideal of the Platonic Academy is feasible and reachable. And uh, for this, I'm extremely grateful to all of you and mostly to Shai. He's done a great job, as you all know. And uh, now to the other evolution. This cursory truth, cursory truth of the evolution of anthropology is stretched along a dual path of otherness and translation. The proverbial anthropologist has rightfully acquired a reputation as a contriver and ringmaster of others. Anthropology is assiduously dedicated to seeking the other, not only by virtue of the pursuit of human diversity, but mainly through the quest of recognizing the human as distinguish distinguishable from the animalism of the non-human. Under the guise of nomenclature such as the savage, the primitive, the native, the indigenous, the subaltern, the other, the other keeps re-emerging in various cultural constructions, constantly sustaining its epistemological function as a marker and indicator of social boundaries. Yet, throughout its annals, the role of anthropology was to translate these others to us. <coughs> Thus, the purpose of this paper is to sketchly track down the trajectory of alterity in anthropological thinking, to stop at a number of turning points and to, allow, and to follow the process of the dissipated concept of the other as it is rendered translatable. The starting point of these deliberations rests with anthropologist heritage as a science of men, namely an intellectual enterprise endeavoring to scientifically unravel the common denominators of human behavior in the form of tenable human universals. The origins of such universals and their interplay with cultural contingencies have always been at the core of anthropological discourse and are currently revamped in the light of new advancement in genetics and neurobiology alongside nascent approaches uh, springing from the reinvention of nature in science studies or in reproductive technologies. However, as this contemporary spirit of the time calls into question the taken for granted divide between nature and nurture, culture and biology, us and them, the very notion of otherness is steadily rendered fossilized. Anthropology has begun its quest for others with an essentialist outlook. The original, indeed primordial anthropological other was deemed a culturally unprocessed human matter, the savage. In the beginning, then, was the image of the unadulterated savage, a pre-cultural creature 
of questionable humanity adopted and engineered by a handful of anthropologists who erected an impregnable divide between a primal mentality incapable of distinguishing mythos from logos and therefore devoid of ethical faculties and bereft of Occidental-like pragmatic uh, rationality. In fact, the epitome of unreason. <coughs> In turn, the place of the savage other, this dubious human, was inherited and replaced by the primitive, who was indeed placed at the bottom of the social evolutionary ladder, but could nonetheless set his sights higher to climb its ranks to rise for the rank of an aspiring Westerner. A presently much disdained term, the concept of the savage nonetheless pervaded, afflicted, and prompted the anthropological imagination as well as numerous anthropological debates, as it suggested an, abri an unbridgeable gap between what was considered to be civilization as opposed to animalism or barbarism. Thus, theory of pre-logical mentalities propounded the notion of an insurmountable barrier sequestrating the valueless beast-like savage from the supposedly rational and morally progressive European. Condemned and renounced though they were, such conceptions are thought to have had an enduring and unflinching impact on anthropological thinking as well as on present day cultural reflections concerning issues of racism and sexism. Hovering between images of nobility and ignobility, the savage, under various cultural guises, remains an icon of reprehensible human, human marked by a non-reflexive, instinctive, and impulsive management of experience. This essentialist view of the savage was presumably repaired in the 19th century anthropological theory of social evolution. Scholars such as Morgan, Maine, Tyler, and Fraser followed sociologist Content Spencer in a promise of bridging the currently dubbed dialectics, dialectics of colonizer and colonized by allow, allowing the latter to emulate and eventually reach the elevated position of the other. Hence, while hierarchical order was sustained, it was transformed into a ladder-like a gradient of progress. This redefined ethos of the other as potentially tame and civilized rather than wild barbarian already ended its metaphor as a distinct and discrete essence. This transmutation was embedded in anthropological theories that raised the other from the level of uncivilized image of the savage to the echelon of a structurally communal oriented primitive hence making the social into a vehicle for transcending the personal from the beastly to the cultural. Enter modernity, and with it, the credo that all humans are born equal. The ensuing ethos of cultural relativism did in fact overturn the much maligned colonialist hierarchy by flipping the vertical axis of familiarity otherness over into a horizontal plateau of cultural differences upon which each culture exhibits its distinguishing behavioral patterns while all deserving of equal value. Within this scheme, each culture, including that of the anthropologist, is capable of being morally tantamount, tantamount to any other culture. Communication and transfers across cultures were contingent on the version of multiculturalism espoused by the observer researcher from absolute and extreme epistemic relativism, where in, in, in insurmountable barriers of language and consciousness divide cultural units from each other, to idioms capable of perfecting fluent com commensurability and, uh, and translatability. That is, from relentless otherness to its complete dissolution. And this is the process that I would like to follow. As a result of that conception, multiculturalism, the notion of the savage or the primitive, has lost its devastating power of excommunication, dehumanization, in extreme cases, extermination. It continues, however, to serve as a definitive reference point 
for ascertaining identity and recognizing culturally shared selfhood. Indeed, zones of collective memories and their corresponding imagined communities and gender politics of difference and identity thereby allowing subaltern groups a voice and a claim for audibility, visibility, and representation. This trend was further <coughs> strengthened with the adv advent of post-colonial regimes of knowledge. The pluralistic and polysemic paradigm of multiculturalism was thus dismantled and liquidized to see the proliferation of hyphenated identities endowed with a double interchangeable gazes of us and them. The other became a stranger, and the dialogical space embracing the colonizer, the colonizer has been constructed and deconstructed <laughs> as the ever-changing habitus for these labile and mercurial social entities. Enter so-called postmodernity and its denunciation of essentialist as well as hierarchical dichotomies. If we are all potentially strangers, and since strangeness surrounds us in reality and fiction, the only way to reconcile with that ubiquitous presence of images of foreigners, refugees, transsexuals, transnationals, nomads, zombies, chimeras, and cyborgs is to acknowledge and live and leave that embodied otherness within our own selves, as psychoanalyst Julia Kristeva pro uh, proclaims. The annulment of otherness, hence, underscores a move towards a reculturation of aliens, while abandoning any illusion of inhumanity and animalization. This is a, trans this is a transnational space of hybridism, translation, mimicry, interactivity, and cultural reversibility transcending boundaries and, de and dematerializing dichotomies. Ingrained in this model of the assumption of hybridity as the main cultural logic of, logic of globalization, as it facilitates an incessant dynamic flow of intermixing, fusing, and converting. In that sense, the hybrid has shifted its cultural position from the terrorizing territory of the witch, the monster, the impure, the stranger, the unhomely, the abjection, and the taboo, to the homely space of everyday cinematic and other media imagery of transsexuality, hyphenated nationalities, mixed races, humanized animals, cyborgs, aliens, and transhuman phenomena all legitimate and welcome sojourns of the postmodern. The previously feared, hence marginalized, hybrid, the perpetrator of moral panic and disorder, is now being shifted to the hub of social interaction. Subse subsequently, domains of supposed irrationality, savagery, and arbitrary unpredictability are transformed into the naturalized order of culture. Otherness, otherness within the postmodern is no longer conceived of as, an in, as indestructible, but as, an, as amenable to domestication, integration, colonization, and transformation. Stripped of its fundamental validity as a key for setting categories of unalloyed meaning and counter meaning, the fabric of this kind of alterity is frayed into hybridized embodied forms such as the carnivalistic, the racially blended, and the transgendered. This process of hybridization echoes what is termed in post-colonial lingo the in-betweenness, embracing, embracing colonizer and colonizer in a mutual mirroring act of domination and liberation, enchantment and subjugation, mimicry and translation, reversibility and fixity, quiddity and liquidity. This apparent breakdown of dichotomies breed a discourse of borderless ambivalences that seemingly ruffles categories of power and subordination, but nevertheless retains and maintains the politics of cultural dependency, camouflaged as symbolic exchange while reinforcing the mastery of uh, the colonizer as the absolute producer of knowledge of otherness. The postmodernist uh, uh, phase in the discursive evolution of otherness is thus also a reflection of a political dis displacement.
labor migration, international tourism, multinational cooperation, the decline of the nation state, the spread of, the spread of information technologies, and the omnipresence of mass and social media. Postmodernism is a currently prevalent cultural ethos of fragmentation, carnival-like masquerading, and unauthorized non-hegemonic texts support these trends by disqualifying the other as a vital referent of essentialism. Networking society and post-national flows cast further doubt as to the constitutive <coughs> role of oppositional otherness in identity formation. In its most extreme form, this cultural medley is altogether devoid of essence, uh, purities, authenticities, and originals, emphasizing instead the pervasiveness of reproduction and simulation. Having lost its, its essen essentially stock the other is no longer effective for forging identities and delineating boundaries. Subsequently, the other, the main object and uh, the main, main object of and for anthropological inquiry, ceases to furnish the discipline, even though the presence of its absence continues to tease and craft anthropological heritage and fantasies. The voices of post-colonialism, feminism, postmodernism, and anti-globalization have greatly expanded the register of sounds emanating from the currently recognized and uh, authorized regions of otherness. Therefore, illegitimate otherness is that whose voice remains absent rather than mute, not necessarily due to silencing and, 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 repre and repression, but because the frequencies of the audio transmitters are not tuned to the auditory receptors of potential listeners, namely the licensed fabricators of the canonized anthropological discourse of otherness. It is perhaps against the most recent crisis of representation and translation that anthropology has entered its post-traditional moment, coming back to the colonialist fascination with the uncivilized, namely those pristine images that seem beyond hybridization. Such basic tropes and prototypical carriers of unembodied irre irreversible selves include, for example, the very old, the mentally disabled, the terminally ill, the Muslim men, the homeless, the refugee, and other ilk of selfless otherness inhabiting an extra-cultural space of mere corporeality. These are all cultural fiends that sociologist Sigmund Bauman called wasted lives, namely worthless selves. Recognition of such entities requires a relinquishment of phenomenological precepts reverberating from the soundboard of shared experience-based knowledge. Thus, current ethics of deconstructing the divide between self and other have to be suspended in favor of a return to the rudiments of the much maligned stance of anthropology according to which otherness was kept at bay as an object for hearing and observing without assumed participation in its evocation or advocacy. What seems to be a self-contradictory construct, almost, almost oxymoronic term, unembodied or non-native anthropology could offer a, heret a, 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 heretic, a, a heretic way out of our conventional midlife neurotypical epistemology. Anthropology of that extra-cultural space must employ non-participant observation, disengaged reflection, taking role distance from the field, considering categories rather than individuals, and looking at deep structures rather than surface rules. These seemingly old-fashioned positivist fits might sense the extra-cultural extra, extra more than attempts at moralizing, assimilating, domesticating, and colonizing it again against its grain. Such inroads, however, invariably lead to a road not taken by today's anthropologies. For dealing with selfless, disubjectified corporeality might risk invoking an amoral corpus of research composed of apparently dehumanized, albeit autonom autonomously respected others something that decent, socially committed scholars cannot afford to contend with, or could they? 
Thank you.